So we call this a panel debate. It's not really a, a panel and it's not really a debate. It's going to be much more of a, of a conversation. And the reason for that is actually pretty easy. I don't know if you guys read Heidegger. Do you read Heidegger? No. It's philosophy. It's good stuff because he talks, talks about being thrown into the world. And, and one of the things that, that uh, you realize if you read Heidegger is that it really isn't about talking about things. That doesn't bring us anywhere. It is talking while you are in the thing that actually makes the big difference. So I think we had announced this to be you know, conversation and it says you know, talking about the management of innovation and technology and analytics and the new digital experiences. But if you've learned anything from today, and I don't know what you have learned, I, I know what four of you have learned because I've thrown this thing around. Um, please just take the stage speakers um, as you're being mic'd up. But anyway, I think you know, what might be more interesting for you guys is that we, we talk about the things that we really uh, care about. So you know, with sports, toasters, elections, finding a partner, factories, cars, and gaming. These are I mean, good things that people talk about. Um, so we don't have cigars and we don't have cognac. But I want you to imagine if that is your ideal setting for a conversation. Maybe it's different. But I want you to enter that mindset. And I also don't like to think of this as a panel. No one likes panels. You don't want to be talked to. So we are in an auditorium in the Greek sense. That means we are all talking. We are all speakers. These guys are just more like uh, Plato. They're just helping you, or like Socrates. They're just helping you unearth something that you know. Um, so I wanted to set the stage that way, because otherwise, in an afternoon at 3 o'clock, you know, no one wants a panel debate. But here we are, and it's not a panel debate. Why don't we start with Phil, because you, get, you, you only had two minutes. Um, I don't want you to talk about yourself, because I think no. other people should talk about yourself. This is um, a brilliant guy. <coughs> he used to run uh, British Council, right? In, uh, uh, the British Council in British Boston. British Consulate in Boston. Um, you now work as an innovation ambassador for, for MIT Sloan, um, working with lots of European UK connections. Yep. Um, I want you to start telling us something very surprising about yourselves. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> That's how we're going to start. Okay. Thank you, Trond. <laughs> so, I've, I've been at MIT 18 months. And I'm still realizing that I'm surrounded by wicked smart people, as they say in Boston, and also just wicked people who throw strange questions at you. Um, my background is actually as a British diplomat, so I'm used to not talking about myself and explaining uh, government policy. Um, but I am delighted to be at MIT uh, the surprising thing is, though I'm at MIT surrounded by these wicked smart people, my background is as a diplomat, and before that I was trained as a historian. So it's an obviously a natural fit for me to be at MIT's <laughs> management school. What I find uh, is the continuation of my career uh, as, as a sort of diplomatic type at MIT is I am, as ever, the diplomatic idiot in the middle. And so my job in a variety of UK-US connections is to help bring the combination of really, really smart people uh, from MIT, uh, several on this stage and several more of the audience, to connect them with places that I care about. So for particularly example, United Kingdom, London. Um, so I'm delighted as a historian to be bringing people together, connecting, and there's a number of different ways we're doing that in London. We've, we've done a few of those recently, which I can speak to. Uh, there's other things we have going, including my quick, breathless two minute presentation on the MIT UK program, uh, which I think I now just officially launched. Um, that I can talk about. The surprising thing is that you're a historian? That is the surprising <laughs> thing, that I'm a trained historian, and yet I'm at the heart of MIT, which is about management and innovation and technology. But there's a role even for us diplomat historian generalists. Are you a big group? Am I a big group? No, this is one of me. Um, <laughs> and I'm the only diplomatic advisor. Although I did find there is a history department at MIT. We hear a lot about the MIT creating the future. We have some really good historians and we force all of the really clever scientists and engineers to go through a couple of things at MIT, one of which is to actually do some history and learn about the rest of the world. And one of the things I find my saying on the history side is, you know, innovation is not an American phenomenon. It wasn't invented in Silicon Valley. 
uh, the historical perspective can be quite useful that you know, innovation in the sense of the Industrial Revolution started on a soggy island off of Europe in about 1750, which I know quite well. Uh, and innovation in the 21st century, the day after tomorrow, the great ideas could happen anywhere on the planet. There's no reason that they should happen in Silicon Valley or Kendall Square. You know, a lot of them are happening here in, in London, but they can happen elsewhere across Western Europe or Asia, the Middle East, all kinds of places. So there's a tension there, right? Um, if, you're, if you're a school that's based in one physical location, you, 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 you want to certainly have a, a slice of all that innovation. How, how, how do generally universities deal with that tension, do you think? The, the, the fact that innovation can occur outside of campus stores or, or outside of capitals or wherever sure. they might have invested time? Well, I think it's a challenge for, for any organization. And I know at one point this panel was something about organizing innovation. I think there are real limits to the concept of organizing innovation with the way that the uh, entrepreneurs, of which I am not one, uh, you know, don't, won't do what they're told. They will go and be entrepreneurial and launch their startups wherever they think their startup's going to do best. You know, at one point, the British government would have loved for the entrepreneurs of Silicon Roundabout to have moved to the, uh, the Olympic Park, because that would have been jolly convenient and used the space there. But that's not how entrepreneurs work. You know, they're, right, they're clustered around Kendall Square. So as an organization, you need to understand where the innovation is happening. And I briefly flashed up the five stakeholder model. And there's a role for us in two-piece suits, whether we're in corporate organizations or government organizations, to understand where innovation is happening globally and the world is not flat and find a way to engage with that, with humility, with that ecosystem of startup founders and entrepreneurs. So I'm going to take a couple of cues from you. But uh, first of all, uh, you know, to respect you as a historian, let's start with our own history. Uh, the morning, for those of you who weren't here, Paul, you, you had shared some stuff with us. Um, don't repeat that, but tell us uh, something surprising. Uh, something surprising about me, yes. Well, once. Yeah, Pressing you or BT? I, I, I'll settle for any. Well, the biggest surprise is I wasn't meant to be here today, but uh, because I'm coming for a colleague, so <laughs> that was my a first secret, surprise. Not a yeah. surprise. Uh, I mean, I think we need to keep things straight. That was a secret. No, so. Yeah. Um, Yes, so, so, so surprising things. Uh, I, I, I think, in a way, I find innovation and re research innovation has always been a surprising activity in the sense that uh, today I find there's a whole range of presentations which surprised me in terms of you know, the, the breadth, the possible depth, the range of applications, some of which they didn't mention, which I think is, is fascinating. Uh, Going on from what Phil was talking about, you know, the, the kind of the right environments for, for, for innovation, I think, from a business viewpoint, where we're not startups and we're not as agile or as flex as Emily presented <laughs> earlier on, yes. Uh, but I guess the key thing is we, are, we need an adaptive function, a receptive function, to take on board a lot of these ideas and engage with this dynamic environment. And the vast majority of large organisations isn't kitted out for that. And I think enabling organizations like BT to have that onboarding function which has a view to how we can introduce experimentation, rapid prototyping, rapid trialing, fail fast mindset into particular areas of the business is, is a key function in making things, things mm. work. Yes. So, so Phil already thinks I'm crazy but, but there, there was actually a, a, a sick rationale behind this and I'm going to go to the professor to figure out this. How would you go about predicting this particular conversation? <laughs> uh, that would be difficult. <laughs> so, um, what I, I think is somewhat unpredictable so far. I'm, I'm trying to get where you are going from. But, uh, <laughs> so I didn't say that prediction always works. <laughs> So, uh, so far, I don't know where you're going. Uh, <laughs> that, makes, that makes two of us. It feels like some sort of Bayesian walk in the forest. We're just wondering what Tron's thinking next. Uh, so it's not very complicated, but I'm just saying, you know, in your field, predictive yeah. analytics, uh, there are... Prescriptive too. There are tools, um, but then the realities are, are always very surprising. What, what do you think of when you're thinking of next generation companies in order to stay abreast of this reality that Conversations like this one might turn out different than you had expected because we are very soon going back to the same questions, but they're, they're questions phrased a little differently perhaps than expected. When you teach your students, many of which were here today and presented startups, um, yeah. how do you prepare for this new world? Is it a purely statistical 
computer science perspective that's going to prevail? Or are the kinds of techniques that you're teaching that you want future innovation to be based on, are they using different So, so from, speaking from experience, yeah, I understand. Speaking from experience, uh, it's, it has never been the case that so in the beginning we set out to do something, huh? you to, uh, in the healthcare space, to try to uh, affect, let's say, uh, what I said in the morning, uh, how to uh, design policies for healthcare. My experience has been that given the feedback we get from the markets, from the people, we eventually build something different than what we started with. It has never been the case that uh, we have done exactly what we set out to do. Um, and I'm not trying to predict that. I mean, I'm trying to get feedback from, from, from people, from people who work, from the customers, quite important, uh, and what, I un what we understand globally in the world to adapt. In fact, one of the practices that uh, I have tried to install in the environments, uh, in the companies I have been involved, is once a week we have an open dialogue with the, the major players in the company about what how we have learned this week. And this I have found, uh, I, we don't have a plan, that is, it's trying to learn. And it has been my